Part two of our lectures on establishing the New England colonies. In part one, we talked about uh, the founding of Plymouth and Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and a little bit on New Hampshire. So right now, and we talked about their economic mixed economy, their economic growth. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about part two. And in part two, we're going to talk about the increasing influence of England in the New England colonies government. So uh, we had talked about King Charles I persecuting per Puritans um, in the last part of our lecture. And so now time has passed and now we're on to another king, King Charles II. There has been a civil war in England between um, the last time we talked and this time and the King of England is broke from that civil war. Um, he's very hesitant to ask his parliament to raise more taxes for him because when his dad did that, his dad got his head chopped off. And so he doesn't want to repeat that. Um, and so King Charles is looking for new ways to raise money for the crown while having to go through parliament. Um, and so he decides to look across the ocean and he notices that his colonies in the New World are starting to make money. They have been um, around now for, depending on the colony, but New England, they've been around now for about 30 years, 30 or 40 years. Um, and they're starting to be successful. Enough colonists have moved there. They've moved far enough inland. They've established their colonies. that now he starts to pay attention to them because they could generate some revenue for him. And so he's looking to them to generate revenue because he doesn't want to tax um, the people back home in England because of what happened to his father. And so England is going to pass a series of laws called the Navigation Acts. Now the Navigation Acts um, are starting to be enforced and what they do is their purpose is to generate money for the crown and also to control trade within the empire um, for the benefit of the crown and the benefit of England. And the theory here goes that if you have a colony, it should exist for the mother country. And so the colony should gather raw materials at a cheap price uh, send them to England, very cheap. England will turn them into something, a finished good or what have you, and then they'll send them back to the colonies and make them buy the, the finished good for a higher price. And if you noticed how that bottle went, cheap prices for raw materials, higher prices for finished goods, and so that means that the flow of money is coming from the colonies and the balance of trade is going to benefit Mother England and that's going to make Mother England richer. And according to the economic theory that we've talked about before, mercantilism, it's the idea that, you know, colonies should exist for the mother country. They make the mother country richer, which increases your pie piece of the world's wealth. And if your pie piece gets bigger, then logically, according to this theory, then your enemies, your rivals, France and Spain's pie pieces will automatically get smaller because there's only so much room in that money pie. Um, so, and so what we're going to do is we're going to enforce these laws, these navigation acts that really try to control trade to bring all the wealth to the mother country. One of those, it says, if we look at this picture over here, it says um, to the colonies, don't export any hats, woolens, or iron since these things are already made in England. Um, and so what that means is it says that the colonies, this is one of the acts of the navigation acts, it says that the colonies can't make anything. Right? They're forbidden to manufacture if it comes in conflict with what they make in England because that might cost English people their jobs. And so the colony should just stay in their lane. Right? They should just make raw materials and send them to England, not manufacture anything on their own. The goal here is to make the colonies a dependent economy, dependent on Mother England, so they would never have, be able to rebel because they have a poor economy and all the money will be flowing back towards England. The next part of the Navigation Acts, it says in the picture, send that tobacco to England. So the next part of the Navigation Acts says that whatever the colonies make by law by the Navigation Acts, they have to send that to England on English ships to English ports. And from there, it may go to France or Spain, whatever, but they want all of the raw materials to go to Mother England so she can control the trade, right? We didn't set up these colonies so that the cheap raw goods can go to France. And then France can get wealthy from this and increase her pie piece. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. So they make a law that all the goods that the colonies produce has to go through an English port first. Um, of course, the colonists aren't going to like this because let's say that you are a tobacco grower in Virginia and you, could, you have your chance of selling to either England or um, France. And let's say France is going to buy more tobacco from you from a higher price. 
Um, so that would make you richer as a tobacco planter. But now, according to these laws, you cannot do that. You have to go with English merchants, and you have to sell to England no matter what, even if they're offering you a lower price. So good for England, not good for the colonies. And we see right here, this is the natural friction you have between children and parent, between the children, the colonies, and the parent, right? The parent thinks the children colony should benefit them, and the child colonies think, wait a minute, I'm getting older, I'm getting more successful, I should be able to control what I'm doing. And so this is this natural friction we see between within the empire between the mother country, England, and her colonies. Next part of the Navigation Acts, it says take that cargo to England to be taxed before you land in another countries. So we had already said that the colonies have to ship their goods through England first, but now we're also going to put a tax on it because, like I said, King Charles wants his money. He wants his due. And, of course, this will make colonial goods more expensive to then be sold to France or Spain once they've gone through an English port because there's a tax attached, which means that maybe France and Spain aren't going to buy it. And so the colonies, this is going to hurt them economically pretty fundamentally. Then the next one we see is you can't export anything except in English colonial ships. And so here's one more way the navigation and acts are trying to help Mother England. It says not only do you have to go through English ports, but you have to use English ships owned by people in the English Empire. Again, that is to keep Spanish and French merchants um, from getting wealthy off of English colonial trade. No, 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 they're our rivals. And so this is, again, all designed to help Mother England and unintended consequence, it's going to hurt the colony's economy. So now, so we have those laws, the Navigation Acts, but laws don't mean anything unless you are prepared to enforce them. And so finally, um, an institution is created by the king. It's called the Dominion of New England, and it is designed to enforce the Navigation Acts. It's kind of like the police of the Navigation Acts. We're going to make sure that all of these things that we just said on the previous slide are going to be enforced. It's going to be headquartered in Boston, and they are going to primarily focus on um, the New England colonies, even though all the colonies have to follow the Navigation Acts. If you remember, we had talked about in the last lecture, the people in Boston, they're the ones that um, build ships and are merchants who uh, run the ships and own the ships. So this is supposed to be a ship. I know it doesn't look very good, right? Um, and so since Boston is the center of colonial trade, this is where we're going to put the headquarters of the, Navi of the Dominion of New England to do enforce these navigation acts on trade. Um, and so we see Sir Edmund Andros is put in charge of the Dominion of New England. He is a, an Englishman, um, and here he is in the picture, and he's walking through the streets of Boston. And as you can see, the people in Boston, they're shaking their fists, they're glaring at him. They don't like him because he makes, Sir Edmund Andros, right, he makes the people of Boston use British ships, and he makes them go through British ports and pay British taxes and only sell to the British. And so this is hurting the colonist economy for the benefit of Sir Edmund Andros and Mother England. So the colonists just don't sit around and take it, right? They're going to do everything they can to undercut this law. And so, because it's in their economic benefit to do so. And so they'll smuggle um, goods to French, um, the Caribbean ports or Spanish Caribbean ports or to Spain or France itself to try to get some of that lucrative money without being taxed. Um, and so here we see uh, it's not violent physical rebellion, but it is rebellion in a sense. It's economic rebellion as this friction between the mother country and colonies continues. Now, for the reasons we don't need to go into too much, the Dominion of New England is going to fall. And we'll talk a little bit why. So back in England, um, we're going to have something called the Glorious Revolution, where another descendant of the Charleses, King James II, he's Charles II's son, um, he is going to get overthrown in England. He's going to run away from England to avoid being killed. And so when he does that, we see a government change in England. Um, and so at that point, that is going to have ripple effect on the colonies. Um, we will talk about in a second. The new monarchs are William and Mary. Now, these monarchs aren't even from England. Um, they're from another country, and they get asked to come to England and sit on the throne um, and with one catch, right? They have to promise that they can't kind of expand the monarch's power. Really, this is going to put Parliament in charge of the English government. And so we have new king and queen, William and Mary, but their, their power has been weakened to quite a bit, and so Parliament is in charge. 
Well, the Dominion of New England was established in the colonies. That was to gain money for the King of England. And now Parliament is like, well, all of those previous policies of the previous kings are gone. Kind of, we're in charge now. And so the Dominion of New England is just dissolved. And so we go back to an era of neglect. Neglect means that the, for once again, Mother England is not going to pay attention to her colonies too much. And so let's kind of put this like on a timeline. So when the colonies are founded, what we have is the, we have the era of what is called benign neglect. Benign means it's not that bad, right? So your mother, colon, your mother country is ignoring her children colonies, but it's okay. And that was when the colonies... Um, you know, we're just get, getting started and they weren't making much revenue and so the king just kind of left them alone. And then we have this period that we've just finished talking about where it's the Dominion of New England and we see that the English are, the king is definitely paying attention, right? He's, he's looking at the colonies and he's like, you will do what I say. He's looking at them and we're getting involved and we're controlling them and that calls colonial resistance. And then when we have the Glorious Revolution, right, um, we see the Dominion of New England falls, and England goes back to a period of neglect, but this time it's called salutary neglect. And in both of the neglect eras, before the Dominion of New England and after, we see that England really doesn't pay attention to her colonies, and they don't enforce the Navigation Acts. They're like, whatever, we have other problems to worry about, the colonies are not generating that much revenue um, for the trouble they're causing when they're upset, so let's just leave them alone. Now this era of neglect again, called salutary neglect, it's going to go until 1763. And when we get to that, the era of salutary neglect ends, and then we're on the way to the American Revolution, right? <clears throat> and at that point, we'll get to another lecture, because it's a little bit in the future. But just to kind of keep it on a timeline, when the colonies are founded, they're neglected from Mother England. Then England starts to pay attention to the colonies in the Dominion of New England. It doesn't go very well. And then the Dominion of England falls because of stuff going on in England. We go back to neglect, and then we go back to England paying attention. So it's a little confusing. Just try to keep that timeline straight in your head. And here we see Sir Edmund Andros, the leader of the Dominion of New England. Um, when the Dominion falls, the people arrest him and drum him out of town, throw things at him, and are like, yeah, stupid Dominion of New England. And so that's when we go back to neglect. All right, so now let's switch gears a little bit, and we're just kind of kind of leave the English and their relationship with the colonies alone for now. And let's talk about the colonies' relationship with the Native Americans now. So when the colonies set up, um, we had seen that, um, you know, there's some friction over land. And we've talked about that, especially in the South when they start growing tobacco and they want more and more land. Well, in the New England the colonies, at the very beginning, when the Pilgrims and Puritans first got there in Plymouth and Massachusetts, there wasn't a lot of friction between the natives and the colonists in the beginning. Because prior to the English colonists arriving, um, some English sailors and Dutch sailors and Portuguese sailors had visited the coast of Massachusetts. And when they were drawing some of the codfish and smoking it, they had had contact with the natives and the natives had caught smallpox and measles from the fishermen. And that devastated the coastal um, Native American population. And so when the Pilgrims and the Puritans landed in coastal Massachusetts, there were no Native Americans to have conflict with. They had almost all died off. And so for about 60 years, well, about 50 years, we see that the colonists had fairly good relationship with the natives in the New England area. Obviously, that's not the case in the South where they had some conflict right off. Um, so they have a little bit different history here. But just because there wasn't a lot of conflict over land doesn't mean there isn't going to be trouble on the frontier. So if you remember in a previous lecture, we talked about how the French came in and started trading with the natives for furs. Um, and so the English are going to do that too. Um, and so let's pretend that this is the coast of England, the coast of New England, right? Here's the ocean. Here's the ocean. Um, and when the English arrive, like I said, most of the natives had been wiped out along the coast. But further inland, there were Native Americans, right? Um, and then there were English on the coast where the Native Americans had died off. And like I said, for quite a while, about 50 years, these two got along because there was nothing for them to fight over. The Native Americans along the coast had already died. 
But the English do want furs. And so they were trading with the, the, the natives, and they said, hey, just like the French, if we give you guns and metal tools and um, beads and alcohol, would you give us some furs in return? And so the natives were like, sure, we'll do that. And so for a while, the relationship was pretty good. So what these natives would do is they would go further inland with the English guns, and they would attack their rival tribes further inland. Um, who for, in control for because they want this area here that's rich in furs. Now there were so as if we can follow all of this, there were natives further inland too, and they were allied with the French. And so the French allies, the French and the the natives who were allied with the French, they were also trying to go into this region for furs. And so we're going to see that when the English arrive, they're going to create kind of spin-off conflict with the natives, not the natives right next to them. But the natives that are further inland, that are friends with the rivals of the English, the French, or the Dutch, you get the idea. And so this is an unintended consequence of the English fur trade. Even though they have good relationship with the natives near them in New England, further in it's going to cause, because of these English goods and this English demand for furs, it's going to cause competition over resources between native tribes. Now, as both native groups, whether they're allied with the French or they're allied with the English, get some of these more modern weapons, muskets, um, tomahawks made of metal, we see that the, the intertribal violence between natives gets more deadly. In the past, they were fighting, for, fighting with Stone Age tools, but now they have a lot more advanced weapons, and so we see that deaths go up, conflicts go up, we see that they're changing their environment that they live in, which is eventually going to lead to starvation, um, increased conflict, more people die, and so we are seeing the native tribes starting to be decimated because of their alliances with the various English nationalities and countries that come in. All right. Of course, let's not forget the smallpox and measles. So as they have more, both of these Native American tribes have more and more contact with Europeans, we're going to see wave after wave of smallpox and measles devastate Native populations. And so within 50 years of, we see Native Americans having contact in New England with people from Europe, we're going to see their population gradually decrease like we've saw, seen in other places, but not just because of these pathogens, but also because of this intertribal conflict. As their society starts to crumble around them, you know, their population dying off, all of this warfare going on, we see that some of the natives convert to Protestantism. They convert to uh, the Christianity of the English. Now, this was not a major goal of the English to go and convert the natives, right? That was mostly Catholic nations that were doing that, like the Spanish. Um, but some of them do, because I think, well, maybe this Christian god of the English has more power than our gods because they don't seem to be dying from smallpox and, and measles as much, and they seem to be advanced, and they seem to be taken care of. And so we see some natives do convert to the Anglican or the, Christ, the English Christianity, and so they live in these praying towns, quote-unquote, and they adopt English ways, they start to dress like the English, pray like the English, live in homes that are copying the English, and so we see that they try to assimilate into English culture. We still do see today some um, Native American tribes who live on um, native land in New England. They're not very many, but they're still there. Um, and so this is kind of the exception to the rule. For the most part, the English will just, um, if they're not trading with the natives, they'll kill and push them west. But so here's just the exception to that. We do see a few natives living in these praying towns. All right, so let's give you a specific example of this war that's going to result between the English and their native allies and the French and their native allies or the Dutch and their allies, native allies over the whole fur trade. And so this is called the Pequot War. So what happens is here we see a map. Here's Massachusetts Bay. That's an English colony, and they have their Native American allies who live near them in western Massachusetts. Now, the Connecticut River Valley is incredibly rich in furs. It's well watered. There's this big river that goes through it. Um, so there's lots of fur-bearing animals there. Well, over here in New Amsterdam is the Dutch, right? And so the Dutch we'll talk about in another lecture, but the Dutch arrive, and they also want to trade with natives for furs. And so the natives who have aligned with the Dutch and the natives who have aligned with the English are going to be fighting over this incredibly rich fur-bearing area known as Connecticut. Um, and so we see that that's where the Pequot War really is the most uh, violent and seems to focus on the most, is in this Connecticut River Valley prefers. 
And so here's an example of just the brutality of these wars. What we see here is a picture of uh, a Native American village. And Native American villages, this is the Native American village here. Um, so we'll just put a house in the middle um, for the Native Americans. And so there's this Native American tribe there, and they're allied with the Dutch. Um, and so here, uh, this is a little stockade of uh, tree posts to kind of keep the, the village safe. Um, and what we see here are, these are English, and these are their Native American allies, um, and they have teamed up to kill this Indian tribe that is hiding in their settlement um, because the, the Indian tribe in the middle is allied with the Dutch. And so we see that intertribal violence in, increases. Now in this particular attack, we see this Pequot village, it's going to be attacked and the English and their native allies set fire to the village and as, as the natives try to run away out of their village to not burn to death, they are shot down and killed and almost all of the natives in this village are massacred, men, women, and children. And so here's just um, a good example of just the, the ruthlessness and the horrible nature of these intertribal warfares that are kind of spilling over from European rivalries. Let's talk an, another, another example about native Anglo relations. And so the Pequot War we see is in the 1630s. And so now let's go a little bit later until the 1670s. And if we can see on this map here, this, all of this kind of yellow area, it shows the amount uh, and the intensity of English settlement in the coastal New England area. And by the 1670s, for the most part, we see that the English have heavily settled along the coast and they have, they're making their way inland into pockets um, of land. Now, I had told you in the past that the natives and the English in Massachusetts didn't have that much problem because the coastal area was pretty much uh, ice, uh, it was pretty much um, devastated. There were no natives left because of the first wave of disease. And so the English got along pretty well with the natives of the interior and even became allies with them. But as the Great Migration continues and Na New Englanders continue to have more and more kids and more and more people m keep moving in, now we see that they start to move inland more and more. And so if you're a Native American in this region who used to have good relationship with the English, now you're like, oh no, what are we going to do? They're taking our land. And eventually the Native Americans just realized they had to make their stand um, because they thought they were friends with the English, but the English just keep coming and taking their land um, because of the population increase of the English. And so the Natives band together under Chief Medicom. Now, the English call him Philip, but his Native American name was Medicom. And so um, Chief Medicom, or as the English call him, King Philip, he unites the tribes and a surprise attack, he attacks um, the English settlers all up and down the frontier. And in the surprise attack, he wipes out many villages, and there's lots of massacres going on, um, and it almost wipes out the English colonies in New England. But the English colonies band together, um, and then they push the Native Americans back, and by the end of the war, um, all of the Native Americans, for the most part, that are living in Massachusetts are either killed um, or enslaved. And so the Native Americans, they didn't kill, they would capture them, and they would send them on boats down to the Caribbean to work and die on sugar plantations. And so we see here is this kind of pattern, right? We've talked about the anglo powhatan Wars. It was very similar to this in Virginia um, that was precipitated over colonists wanting land for tobacco. And when that war was done, for the most part, all of the Native American tribes, for the most part, in the Chesapeake region had been destroyed. And here we see later, almost all of the Native American tribes in New England have been destroyed. And this pattern repeats itself again and again and again as English colonists push west, trying to get more land, coming into conflict with new um, Native groups that they haven't come in contact with before. All right, so that takes care of Anglo-Indian relations. Let's now talk about E. It says the New England experience changes. So I had made a big a point in part two talking about how when the New Englanders came, the Puritans and Pilgrims, they were coming as families and they were coming together united by their faith to try to create a religious community. And so I kind of have it here with this, this rectangle kind of represents the New England society. It was all together. We didn't see a lot of class difference because they believed that God wanted them to come together and support one another um, in Christian brotherhood. 
But as time goes on, some New Englanders get rich and some don't. And so we start to see this utopian community dream start to fall apart after two or three generations. We see wealth gaps develop. So we see a hierarchical society instead of an equal society. And at the top we have merchants, people who own those boats going in the triangular trade, and they're becoming very wealthy from that. Then we see artisans. We see that New Englanders, even though the Navigation Act say they can't do it, during the era of neglect, they start to make um, their own finished goods, like they start to make their own rum, or they start to make their own boats. Um, and so we see that the artisans have a skill and they, they get paid more. Then we see small kind of subsistence farmers who aren't very wealthy. That's why they're kind of down in the pyramid. Um, they don't have a lot of social standing. Um, and so they're down here. They have small farms. And then we have a bunch of people, landless laborers. Maybe these are indentured servants or they're the third, fourth, or second son of a man. Remember, primogenitor says that when your dad dies, the only person that can inherit the farm is the oldest son. So the second, third, and fourth born sons don't get any land, and so they're landless laborers. And notice that this kind of relatively poor part of the society is the most numerous. It's the widest, and it's the deepest. And so we see a small elite group of people controlling the government. They're the ones that are going to be elected to colonial legislatures. They're the ones that are going to pick the, the ministers for our churches. They're going to dominate the town hall meetings. And so we start out as this fairly egalitarian equal society. And then as wealth increases, we see the wealth gap increases. And we start to have some conflict in our society between the haves and the have-nots, between the wealthy people at the top who own everything and the people at the bottom who own almost nothing. Interestingly enough, we'd seen this same thing just happen quicker in the South, where you had the plantation owners at the top and everybody else at the bottom. And so let's continue on with that idea of the communal experience declines. And so as New England towns grow and the colony becomes more prosperous, right, let's say we have this guy right here. Um, and he has three sons. And the firstborn son will inherit his farm. Let's say his farm is right here. And you inherit it in total. What happened to his second and thirdborn sons? Well, they're landless laborers. And if they want to ever have any money at all, they're going to have to pack up and maybe move and create a new town further west. A new town further west. And so we see this as an example of that will eventually something that will lead to the King Philip's War. As more and more people start to move west to try to get some wealth, get some land, move up in the social structure and running into Native Americans who don't want to give up the land. And so we see wealth gap increasing and also we see the colony kind of spreading west. Now this is going to lead to one of the most important social events in the colonies um, in the 1730s. Um, and so it starts, what's going to happen? It's an example of this changing society. It's called the Great Awakening. Now the, great, the word Great Awakening, it, it, when they talk about awakening, it means people finding God again. And it's not like the people in America weren't religious. They were religious, but it's going to come as a very emotional reconnection to God and Christianity. Um, and so that's why it's called this Great Awakening. And so what is going to cause this? Well, first of all, we're going to see these splits in society cause this. As the poor people move west, the people who have small farms or landless laborers, they're very frustrated and upset. They're living, on the they're living out on the frontier, and they're a long ways away from community, and so they feel isolated. They feel downtrodden. They don't control um, the town council, the town hall. They don't, con they don't get to pick who the ministers are. Um, they don't get to partake in all the ceremonies and and celebrations in the village commons or village green. And so they feel kind of ostracized from the community. And so they're angry. Plus, living on the frontier, you're the first to be attacked by natives. Um, you have to chop down your trees. You have to plant your crops. You have to get the farm started. And that's hard work. And a lot of times, the weather doesn't cooperate, um, and your crops don't grow, and your children are hungry. And so we see, again, I'm trying to paint this picture of these um, impoverished, angry frustrated, isolated people on the frontier as we move west. Um, also resentment. Like I had said, these people on the frontier in these small communities that are just popping up, they, they are angry because the coastal communities that have been established longer, they're where the rich merchants are, and they get to pick, they get to pick who goes to the colonial legislature. They're the ones that get elected. Um, they get to pick who the ministers are that control their faith. And so if you're a poor frontiersman, 
You don't have any control over your life. Native Americans attack you, the crops don't grow, the government doesn't seem to listen to you because they only are controlled and care about the Eastern elite. Um, they control the economy, they're not, you know, they tax you, you don't have any say in taxation. Um, they don't even, you don't even control your faith because, you know, the Eastern elite control who your minister is going to be. And so there's this kind of societal um, anger bubbling up um, in the community. One more reason for this great movement that we're going to talk about, these are all causes of the Great Awakening, is we see that in the East, the Eastern elites that live on the coast, right, they're educated. Um, they've maybe gone to the new university called Harvard University or King's College or Princeton. Um, and so they are very in touch with this movement in Europe called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment is the idea that people should have rights and freedoms and democracy and that God exists maybe by but he's, he's what we, these, Christ, these Christians are called deists. They say that God exists and he created physics and, and gravity and he created the laws of human rights, but then he kind of just took a vacation and he's content to let humans kind of run things for themselves with science and logic and reasoning. So it's a very intellectual movement. But for the people on the frontier who are living the struggled life, you know, if, if their wife is sick and their crop has failed and their children are hungry and the Eastern elite have made them pay taxes, um, you know, this enlightenment, this philosophical movement doesn't feed the soul. It doesn't make them feel any better. They want a more personal connection with God, um, not an intellectual connection. Um, and so we see that there's this, there's this simmering discontent with the philosophical leadership of the society, the religious leadership of the society, the political and economic leadership of the society, and the people on the frontier are angry and frustrated. And so we see this leads into the Great Awakening. So this religious revival actually starts in England among the poor and middle classes of England who are also looking, yearning for more control over their faith, a closer connection to a caring God who's going to help them raise their status in society or have food to put on the table for their kids or make sure when they die they go to heaven. They like the spirit, they want a spiritual connection to God. Um, you can understand how that would be important to people who are struggling in their lives, the poor and the lower classes. And so we see that start, that movement starts in England. And one of the preachers who's going around England talking about that everybody can get connected to God, poor and rich, um, skilled and unskilled, educated and illiterate, all of us can get a connection to God. We don't need some elite between us and God. And that message was incredibly popular, like I said, among the lower classes in England, so he comes to America. And his message goes to America. And so here's another example of anglicization, of things happening in England, and then us kind of bringing it to America and copying it here. And so George Whitefield is going to go around, and his audiences are going to be strongest on the frontier regions. Like I said, people on the frontier have tough lives, and they're yearning for a connection to God that's direct, right? They, you know, if here's God um, in the past, in order to, for them to know God, they had to go through, you know, the, the local minister that was elected by the elite, and I can't, this is me, I can't know God until, you know, somebody tells me what God wants, and so there's not a personal connection. But this, these preachers of the Great Awakening are saying, no, 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 we don't need all this. It can just be you and God having a personal connection. You don't need educated ministers. You don't need the elite getting between you and God. And so this is a very kind of democratic religious movement that everybody can have a connection to God. God cares about you. And in fact, intellectualism and the Enlightenment have no place in the world, right? It should be emotional and you get back to God. And so we see that this is kind of a challenge to the Eastern elite who wanted to control everything. And so here we see, you know, these, these ministers gave these incredibly emotional sermons. You can see her, right? She's just in awe. And that's very appealing because the people on the frontier, they didn't go to Harvard. Um, they didn't, you know, they haven't had a chance and the money and the time to get an education. And so they can't really sit and think about religious theology. They want a religion, they want a Christianity where they can just feel God. And you don't have to go to you don't have to go to a university or college to be able to feel God. This is approachable for all the common people. 
And so a hallmark of the Great Awakening is it's intensely personal and democratic. Anybody can stand up and give a sermon. You don't have to have one of those East Coast elite ministers do it. Um, and everybody can feel emotion, so everybody can feel God in their life. And so this intense revival of Christiani Christianity sweeps through all of the colonies, but especially on the frontier regions. Here we see another minister of the Great Awakening. His name is Jonathan Edwards. And George Whitefield gave the sermons of intense love and joy and getting God in your life. Jonathan Edwards is going to use another emotion, but it's, it's intense fear, right? He gave these, these sermons called Jeremiads, where it's intended to use fear of disappointing God to get you back to the church and to get you feeling religious again. Um, and he has this sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And in the sermon, he says that all of us humans are sinners and we're in God's hand and he's angry at us and he's holding us over a pit of burning fire. Um, like a, a, somebody would hold a spider in their hand and any time he could just tip us tip his hand to the side and we could all fall into hell, but God and grace and, and patience is saving us. But you better get your act together because you don't know how long God will be patient with you. And so, you know, it's kind of this fear of, oh my gosh, I better get religious again. And so both of these guys you can consider part of the Great Awakening because they're using emotion to connect with people. One joy, one fear, but it's both part of the Great Awakening. Okay, and so let's talk about, so we've talked about the causes of the Great Awakening, and we've talked about kind of the leaders of the Great Awakening, so let's now talk about its impact on the colonies. Well, first of all, it's going to split the colonies up into kind of two groups. Um, you're going to have the old lights versus the new lights. So the old lights are the people who are the East Coast elite, who have the most money, the most power, the most wealth, and they don't want things to change. They like their religion just fine, thank you very much, where they're in charge of the ministers. But the new lights, they want things to change, right? They like this new Great Awakening. They like the fact that the, the, these new ministers say anybody can be a minister, anybody can connect with God, because um, it's more democratic. It gives them finally what they've been wanting, control over their faith, controlling over some aspect of their lives without the old elite getting in the way. Next, we're going to see two new sects of Christianity um, coming from England. We see the Methodists and the Baptists, and these are great awakening denominations of Christianity. They're intensely emotional, and um, we see that they're, they're going to be really popular among the lower classes who want more control over their faith and like the great awakening, the new lights on the frontier. Right? So we're going to see new kind of Christian denominations pop up in, in the colonies. So there's, there's a word for this called pluralism. Pluralism mean you have, means kind of a heterogeneous society. It means that you don't just have one kind of white colonist. You're going to have um, colonies that are very diverse. You're going to have colonists that are English. And within that English colonist, you're going to have rich and poor. You're going to have um, Methodists and Baptists, and then some of the more traditional churches. So the Anglican Church in Massachusetts is called the Congregationalist Church, and that's the old elite. And so you're going to have Congregationalists, and you're going to have Anglicans, and you're going to have Methodists and Baptists. And so we can, we're going to have a very diverse America. Even from the very beginning, America has been somewhat of a melting pot. We've got all of these different kinds of people living here. And so it's a pluralistic society, right? Um, the Great Awakening is an example of Anglicization, right? We said it's an example of something that starts in England, the Great Awakening, and then it gets transplanted to the Americas. Um, like, like representative democracy, we have parliament in England, and we're going to start to have colonial legislatures in the colonies where people elect them to go um, you know, make laws for them. And another idea of pluralism we're going to see is that, all right, so here's the southern colonies, and they're mostly settled by English people. Um, and so here in New England. But then you notice, right, we're going to see that there's going to be, we're going to talk about in future notes, Dutch, German, um, French up here along the Great Lakes, Quakers, we're going to talk about them. Um, these are all different groups of Christianity, and then some even groups, we're going to see a Jewish population set in Ro settle in Rhode Island, because remember we said Roger Williams is going to let anybody come in. And so we have a very diverse society, and it's just going to keep getting more and more diverse as we go through American history. All right, and so what this says is it says that numerous sects of Christianity and ethnicities and colonies is going to make the Great Awakening possible. What I mean by that is 
if everybody in the colonies was of the same mind as far as God and religion goes, it would have been really hard for these priests from England, these Great Awakening priests, to come and teach about a new version of Christianity. But since we have rich and poor, um, English and Dutch and German, we have all of these different kinds of people, it's naturally that the people on the bottom who don't have any control over society are going to want to embrace something new that gives them some control of their faith. Um, and so we see that it's, it's easy for people, if we have diversity to begin with, to become even more diverse as time goes on. And that's it for our lecture.